Mick, I'll see you at the pub later. So you're, you're meeting up? Yeah, making a new Kinks album. <laughs> <laughs> Inspired by the Rolling Stones. Are you really? Or are you, or are you yeah, well, we're my talking leg about it because I've got all these songs that I wrote for them in the band, not broke up, we parted company. And um, I think it's kind of an appropriate time to do it. So, uh, for, for, for 20 odd years, you've been asked whether the Kinks yeah. will get back together. Yeah. Are the Kinks getting back together? Officially, we are, yes, in the pub later on. <laughs> It'll be, it won't be well organised like the Rolling Stones. I must praise the Rolling Stones for being great at publicity, great band, great at organising their careers. Mick's done an incredible PR job. And um, it's kind of inspiring to see them doing it, playing the big... But the Kinks will probably play in a local bar. But them. you will play? Yeah, there's something telepathic. On Our Country, this new album, I use an American backup band because it's not whether they're virtuoso players or not, it's whether they fit together and they have a, a, what they call telepathy. And you don't have to be great players to be in a band, you sort of, you sort of lock into one another and fit, fit in whether you know the other one's making a mistake, say I'll play it louder there so they won't notice. It's a bit like that. Kinks were like that. So w which of the kinks will get back together? Those that are still alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, our first bass player, we've got an album coming out later this year called The Village Green Preservation Society, the anniversary album. And that was the last album the first band made before the bass player Peak Wife left. So it's kind of a tribute to him and the first band. Again, did you hear that? It's all right, don't yeah. What was I saying? <laughs> Five seconds. About, 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 about the band members, the band members. Yeah. The trouble is, the two remaining members, my brother, Dave and Mick, never got along very well. But I made that work in the studio. I, it fired me up to make them play harder and with fire. And um, so if I can re recapture those moments. I, and I've got tunes, I've got some great Kings tunes in my head. And do you get on with both of those guys now? Uh, yeah, we have summit meetings occasionally in the local pub. And your brother as well? Separately. Haven't brought them together in the same room yet, but we're working on it. Are you, are you, are you close to your brother? Do you get on? You know, I'd like to say no, but my, my brother is much brighter than I am. I'm, I'm kind of a lost soul, really, but he's very in touch with his spirit, his soul, the cosmos. And he's very ethereal. And he's very good at chess. So he's got this combination of maths and artistic endeavour. How much did you write songs together with your brother? Never. Never? We, oh, I, I wrote a bridge. He had a song called Death of a Clown that he couldn't finish. And I wrote the bridge for it. The bridge is the middle part that takes it to, to another section. So we, we didn't write that much together. But we, again, he knows what I'm thinking. And in the studio, it's much easier to do that. Because I say, with the regular music, Jayhawks who played on our country, great musicians, and they knew each other. And I had to teach them a language. Uh, you know, when I do this, it's too loud. When I do that, cut. You know, it's sign language, because in the studio, you're just playing away on one take, and you rely on what I call telepathy. So the Kinks had that intuitively, because my brother, obviously, we grew up with, with one another. And um, singing families, the Carter family, you know, the Isley brothers, the, the uh, Cohen brothers. Not very good singers, but great filmmakers. But did, did you always fight? I mean, was it all, always turbulent? Not total violence, just occasional violence. But we, we tapered off down the years. We've got other people to be the punch bag. <laughs> I, Mick is from South London, Mick Avery, and he had to answer a questionnaire the other week saying what was it like growing up in Muswell Hill. <laughs> He'd never been in Muswell Hill before he joined the Kinks. It's also very territorial. I'm very North London in my writing. I think it's a lot to do with the light and um, 
Marx grew up, well, he, he lived in North London, Dickens. Dickens must have been on the run from creditors because there's a, every, every district you go to in London, there's a Charles Dickens lives here. <laughs> he must have escaped his uh, money collector. But it's a lot North London light, Alexander Palace, Hampstead, Highgate. And I'm sure people in Crystal Palace feel the same way about where they're from. But London's very territorial. When you were writing those songs mm. 50 years ago, did you think you would still be... And two years ago. And two years ago. No, but I'm thinking the, you know, the, the, the King ones. song yeah. the songs. Did you think you'd still be doing it now? I didn't, I didn't think past 23, to tell you the truth. Yeah, when, I think it's the same nowadays. When you're young, you, feel, you have no concept of what it's like in the future. You don't want to think. You've got no time to think about it. You're too busy living. It's only when you reach middle age you start thinking, oh, what's happening? Um, but I, I've always been aware <coughs> of writing about the neighbourhood where I grew up. Because <coughs> You Really Got Me was a big hit all over the world. It's the fifth song I ever wrote. And um, I had no life experience, so I had to come up with material all the time. And I wrote about my neighbourhood. Songs I call to Mormonac is about a local garden, a local people, well respected man, is about a businessman who lived near me. So, all these uh, dedicated follower fashion was after a punch up with a designer who accused me of wearing flares and they weren't flares. So, it's all life experience I had, and I did, had no idea I'd be talking about it all this time down the line. Or, but, but listening to those songs and detaching myself from it, there was an interesting narrative there, someone growing up in an era, diary of a nobody, you know, an ordinary person growing up in London. Maybe that's some sort of legacy. But, well, that's, that's throughout your writing, isn't it? There is a narrative throughout your writing in a way that there, there isn't with all pop and rock songs. No, uh, I think uh, some, some, some novelists do that. I can't mention any names right now, think of any names, but they have continuing characters in and out. When I read Orwell, I see Winston Smith in Coming Up For Air. And he, although he's not referred to in the book. So there's a, there's, I think write, uh, novelists do that a lot, and I, I tend to do it as a songwriter. And thankfully, my audience that sticks with us pick up on that. Oh, I, I know who he's talking about. Is it always about you? No, I, I'm, a, I'm a character actor. That's why I think the Kinks never really reached the heights of popularity or awareness, some of her peers did, because I was, I, was, I was the same singer, singing a well-respected man, tongue-in-cheek, cynical, slightly cynical, as a, the earnest young boy singing all day and all the night, different people. So I, I write a song about a, a character, and I interpret it like an actual would. Except, I think that's where the new album, Americana, Our Country, is different. It's from my personal perspective. And it's, it's a first for me, and a lot of people have been surprised when they heard it. To say, I didn't know you went through that thing. Especially with Our Country. You're, you're, you speak on these songs as well. Yeah. About, you know, your experience of America. Yeah. Why, why are you doing that? I mean... It, Spoken word. Yeah. Because... It's, first of all, Americana was a book. Then I wanted. To, I had a meeting with a very big company. We, it was Universal, but we don't mention their name. A company who we named it. Said, Let's invent a format that can. This is like 15, 20 years ago. Invent a format that can work with iPhones, work with music, deliver the music and the audio, and books in the same same device. And of course, they didn't want to do it then. When they do it, they'll come up with a plan and someone will invent it. So the written word first, incorporating lots of new songs. Again, in New Orleans, I wrote many songs like a diary. There's a song called The Big Guy on the new record that was written in the emergency room while I was waiting to be attended to in hospital. So, so I keep a diary. Music, is, to me, is a diary as well. Samuel Pepys, I guess. And do, you, do you feel the need to, you know, to get it out there? Because there's a lot of it. You know, there's a lot of track. You know, people put out track. You know, albums these days with, with just a few tracks. But there's mm. a lot of music 
um, in this two-part album. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. is it, is it you still bursting about, out? You haven't heard about the three-album deluxe yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's all... I, I put the sub... I, I stretch my writing. <clears throat> you know, I love three-minute singles. Tired of Waiting with the, by the Kinks is my sort of classic. One of the great singles of all time was I Want to Hold Your Hand by the Beatles. Had an intro, verse one, verse two, punchline, bridge, great bridge. I love the structure, but th I'm trying to work on the unstructured form in the sense it's like going to see a play on the new record and spoken word comes into it. And I use an actor on the album called The Invaders, track called The Invaders, called John Dalgleish, who played me in the musical. And so I cut back and forth. He, he plays me then, and I play me now. I mean, that, that's what I thought listening to it last night, that it actually feels a bit like listening to a musical soundtrack. Um, and I just wondered whether your work in musicals has mm. ended up influencing the albums. Yeah, vice versa, because there's a lot of theatricality. There's a, I'm known, I know you want to talk about famous songs. There's a song called Celluloid Heroes. There's a story about L.A., and I lay, I lay the groundwork for six minutes. And the record company was saying, what's this bloody album called? We've heard six minutes of music. Then I deliver the punchline. The payload comes in the last line. So I've waited for six minutes and 30 seconds. So n nobody had done that at that time. because Everything says, get the title out there straight away, which is a conventional and still the standard. But I wanted to make it a bigger experience. And I think I've always challenged myself and my poor audience to come on this journey with me. I think unless you can experiment with different ways of saying things, different ways of writing, you just write one book and go away and do something else, be an economist or something, or a journalist even. <laughs> do you, and do you feel you're getting better still? Better what? At, at, at what you do, <laughs> as a musician, as a, as a writer. <laughs> I've been officially declared a sane. <laughs> um, I'm always hoping to write the next song is a great song. I've, I've got a bunch of songs now. So I was sort of joking slightly about the Kings. But if I got them in the same room, I, when we put it down, and the same with the Jayhawks on Our Country, uh, when we put a track down, we wanted it to be the best track ever made. And when, to get in that mindset. You know, a runner doesn't start a race to finish second. You finish first, and so always, I always try to achieve the best out of what I'm doing at that time. Of course, there's an element of laying back. You know when to lay back with the music, but generally speaking, think of it as it's going to be on top of the pops if they ever bring it back. Uh, with regard to, I mean, in terms of it being Americana, I yeah. mean, is, do you have a love affair with America? I mean. <clears throat> I'd love to say I hate the place, but when I was growing up in post-war London, 1950s, early 60s, America represented freedom, a place where you could have anything you wanted. We still had rationing when I was at school. So uh, and my family, lived, my, my parents lived through the Second World War. My father lived through the First World War. So they had experienced a lot of poverty. And even in the, when they were growing up, there's a song on the album called Oklahoma, USA, which is written about my older sister who's sadly passed away. And her job aspiration, she left school at 13 or 14, living in Holloway. And it, the most she could aspire to was to be a seamstress in a factory or pack boxes. And in the song Oklahoma, USA, she sings about being there with um, all film stars, and Clark Gable's going to take her away to Oklahoma, USA. So the films, America delivered the films, and I think it is the country of the 20th century, delivered the damn automobile movie, invented dreams. And I went there with the dream in the 1960s with the band. And, and where do you think it is in the 21st century? I mean, is it, is it, is it going down the tubes? Is it no longer I the country that... We aspire to. My personal take is a very confused, young country, still a young country. Again, going back to our country. That song was written for the Patriots of America in my musical um, to sing when they saw the British invasion coming. 
So this is our country, it's a proud country. We're going to build a better world. What they've done, they've assimilated cultures, I think, better than we have. Because I think the land mass is big enough to, to absorb cultures. You've got German people, German influx of German immigrants in the mid Midwest, Milwaukee, Scandinavians in Minnesota generally. And gen this is very generalized opinion. But, but it's absorbing many cultures. They have the oath of allegiance, which may sound a trivial thing, but for those few seconds that people say it, it must mean something to them. I like to think it does mean something to them. So it's a country struggling with identity still, I think. And you still think it's a great country? What, one that you sort of no, still I think, dream of going I, to? I think it has potential, but I'm not sure which way it will go. Because it, it's, it's so fragmented. When, when the Kinks went back to tour there, after being banned for four years, we started from scratch. We toured, 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 and found a different culture. The Midwest is heavy metal land, I think. The South attracted me to go to New Orleans. Is primarily folk music, Cajun music, of course, Afro-Caribbean music that came in from the islands, the voodoo culture, which I touch on on the record. That a nice thing, all these music they picked up country and western on the way up and floated up the Mississippi to Cleveland and became rock and roll. So it's a combination of all of these elements. How do you feel about Britain now? I'm quite worried actually. I think I don't want to be saying the wrong thing. I'll keep writing about Britain. I think. The reason I'm going to keep writing is because in years to come, maybe there'll be one, one voice through my song. It'll be, I'm, I'm, not I'm not a journalist, but I write from this ordinary person's perspective. And keep in mind, musical diary and keep coming up with stuff. It's evolving, but our difficulty is space. There's no space to put. You know, we had the empire and we went out and conquered all these countries, or conquered took them under the, emp the empire. Then, then the empire struck back and there's nowhere to put everybody. So what are you worried about? Um, this political situation this year, what's happening next, the word I don't say. Brexit? Yeah, is I think one of the biggest. Again, I grew up in a different time to, and my parents remember the Second World War and that generation is fading away fast. Uh, but I inherited a lot of their fears, their hopes for a better world. I'm just concerned that this is, I think, in my opinion, it's one of the biggest debates we've had since the end of the Second World War. Do you feel they're making a mess of it? According to people on TV, I try not to watch TV, but everybody is scared. Everybody's in turmoil about it whether they admit it or not, it's affecting everybody, unless you've got tons of money. So do you think it's a mistake? What's a mistake? Leaving the European Union. I, I think you've got to get uh, control of your own destiny. If you manage to negotiate control of your own destiny, politically, economically. But then, I don't want to be pessimistic, but the, the bad work's being done. The, the foreign oil guards are sheltering money shelter becoming like a tax haven i wrote another show called preservation about an evil dictator called mr flash who turned an innocent little country village into a big megalopolis of corruption and investment and in the end he's taken over by mr black and it sounds weird but mr black who completely turns the country on its head and the only way to have absolute change is to have absolute power. And I, I fear for what it's going to become, but I think the great thing we have here is moderation. In the end, I think common sense will prevail. It's all about scoring points and grabbing airtime. And um, I think, like I said, common sense has got to prevail. If you don't, if you don't have it, Unity, our country, it's a proud country. It's not jingoistic. We, we have a tendency to become like the football. Now we're conquerors of the world. We play two third world countries. And, and 
I hope we go on to win it because this, this is the most talented bunch of footballers I think we've had for a long time. I'm still not quite clear what you think about Europe, though. I simply I mean, don't know. You don't know? Well, I don't know because when we, when we first started touring, we played Germany, Belgium, Holland, Benelux, Scandinavia. And we just had the aftermath going on tour. I remember a coach driver in Dusseldorf leaving me behind at the hotel. And the tour manager said, then why did you leave without this gentleman? He said, because I was in the prison of war camp. There was still that feeling hanging on when we started touring. But I find all the countries, Scandinavia is well organised, there's a lot of politics, I think it's socialist, Scandinavia. So, so do you feel that being part of the European Union helped us heal all of those things that you were... Rock, rock music, I think, helped heal a lot of the social, not, not change the world, but help communicate ideas to different countries through, through the Beatles music, the Kinks music particularly, because we had social, political content in our songs. The Who, of course. I think it helped bridge the gap, language gap, and a new generation came up. But um, there's still there's still elements out there. I remember again in Dusseldorf being banned from a restaurant because I was English. So, you know, so, so I mean, you, I don't, don't think you can state what people are like. Everybody has it inside them. There's a kernel of information that says, I am what I am. As much as people try to assimilate, there's something inside them without bringing religion, politics, economic reason, that will drive them and let them become something they never thought they'd be before. So are you still pulled more towards America, culturally, than, than Europe? No, I'm pulled, to, pulled towards Cork in Ireland. I've got a daughter in Ireland, and I miss her very much, don't see her very much. I think the secret is in the young people. The youth will come up. And the smart kids now don't listen to what's in, on X Factor. They listen to what they can find from archive. Going back to the kinks, you said, you know, a lot of people don't know, they know the songs, but they don't know the band. That's very, very important to stay in touch. When I was 17 years old, I went to see a 70-year-old blues man play at Croydon Fairfield Halls called Sonny Boy Williamson, because I had to, ex not just to listen to his records, but experience his presence. And I think it's important to do that. Not, not with video, not with iPhones, but in, in the present. That's what's so great about the Rolling Stones playing gigs. Did you go and see the Stones? No, I wouldn't pay for that piece of crap, you're kidding. <laughs> But it's very striking, you know, in the last month or so, we've got Paul McCartney putting out a new record, you're putting out a new record, the Stones are touring. Paul got a new record out. You're, you're, you know, you're all getting on, but yeah. you're not slowing down. Well, I tried to slow down several times, even got shot and didn't slow down. I think with me, I can't speak for the others because, you know, everybody's different. I, I do it because it defines me as a person. You know, I was an art student, a failed art student. Without art and without music, I'm not sure what I would have done because I left school at 15, lucky to win a scholarship to go to college. But um, not, music saved my life. It turned me into a better person. Do you, do you, you're sometimes called the godfather of Britpop. The uncle. Do you, do you, do you, oh, the, okay, the uncle. Um, the cool older brother. Um, do you, do you get why? I mean, do you, do you, are you happy to be that? Well, that Britpop came about the time I was most disillusioned with being in England. But I'm happy to be called part of it because I think it's more in the sentiment and the sensibility of the music rather than the actual factual lyrics. Um, it's nice to be associated with something. There wouldn't have been Blur without the Kings, would there? wouldn't be the same blur. Every so often, <clears throat> the music industry is going, can I take a sip yeah. of water? <clears throat> Every so often a band comes along that defies, you can't invent it, record companies try to invent the new thing. 
Oasis of a band that couldn't be stopped. Nirvana, the greatest band to come out of America, I think nothing since Nirvana is on a par. They exploded, they forced their way through it, and that can be done with music. Still, to a lesser degree, it's more, I think young artists now have to play the game more, play the social media game. But there's some great new artists out there, and as long as you have new artists, I think it will move forward. But corporations can't create style. They can only distribute it. Um, 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 what do you think? I mean, obviously, you, you, you played in bands and you played um, guitar you know, music. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I just wonder, you know, what, what, what you make of all the, the, you know, all, all the new genres of music that have come since mm. the 60s, you know, sort of whether it's grime or rap or any of that kind of, sort of street music. I love music grime. Now. You I, like love, it? I love grime. I think it's extreme. You know, I've got a couple of swear words on our country. And when someone like me on a grime record is taken for granted, it's a stylistic issue. If someone like me swears on a record, it's a big deal. So I was in two minds. It will never get airplay. It's called Muswell Kills. It will never get airplay, but I had to put it on the record because it was the vernacular I was working with at the time. I think, I think, I call it bedsit music, people who make music on their own apps, is important. I do songwriting courses. I'm doing one next month in Yorkshire, and probably most of those writers who come for the week will be in what I call bedroom, making using synths. We, we give them on the course a chance to connect with an audience, and evolve, the songs evolve differently. But um, I, I, I like all sorts of music, and I, and I welcome change. It's got to have, it will find its content, context, eventually. It's a form of expression. I think possibly grime and anything else that comes out that's fashionable tends to, I'm sure you aren't, I guess, I'm sorry, it becomes fashionable tends to get corrupted and not all grime is great but it's a way to express a heartfelt emotion that's why I use spoken word you know I had there's a song called Calling Home there's a song called The Big Weird on the new record and I thought fuck it I don't want to write a song about it I just want to say what I mean and I think there's an element sorry for sorry damn it um, there's an element of expressing at any cost because a lot of kids don't have time to think about how to express themselves. A lot of them don't have to... For a, country, for a world that's so advanced, a lot of kids are really under, under, under-educated. And they, 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 they fall to the device, the app. And I think there's going to be chronic communication problems in about 20 years. Do you think you were better educated? Did I date you or the app? <laughs> Do you think you were better educated and aware of the world when you were that young? Well, I, I learned about old heroes like Lawrence of Arabia and Churchill and people like that, Clement Attlee. They were, in a strange way, didn't go much further than that. Who, who created the health system? Bevan, an Iron Bevan? Yeah. Didn't really come much further than that. And that's another issue I don't want to get into a conversation about. But I've, got, I've got big issues I want to write about. I want to write about the pharmaceutical industry, somehow turn that into a piece of art, because it's a piece of work as it is. Because, I mean, well, I presume you've had a lot of interaction with health systems all over the place, between yeah. being shot and yeah. having your own health issues. You know, I, d- I did an interview for one of the networks, ABC, after I got shot, it's one of the net- networks, and this very intelligent lady, host, anchor person, talking to me. I said, it's so poor in the hospital. I was in a hospital called Charity, and it's barely, you can get clean towel. She didn't understand the fact there were poor people in America. Now, this is in a New York studio, one of the big networks. But America is a very poor country in places. And New Orleans, if it wasn't for oil, being a Gulf, 
on the golf. It's probably be allowed to sink. It's below sea level. It's a very poor place. And do you not feel that Britain has those kinds of pockets of politics? Of course we do, yeah. yeah. And they get generally swing to the right, don't they? Could you just tell us, because we mentioned it a couple of times, could you just tell us about being shot? And could we just do that story? I mean, how did, how did you get shot? I can't talk about it. <laughs> just tell us what happened. Well, two days before, somebody came up to me and said, I'm going to kill you. I need to take that kind of thing to heart. Two days later, I was walking down the street with my partner at the time. And this guy came up to me and said, get out of the way. I said, you're in an Eddie Murphy movie, what's the problem with you? He said, he hit me over the head with a gun. I fell to the ground. When I got up, my partner was on her knees and he was pointing the gun at her head. He sh shot to her left to frighten her to give her a bag. And normally I'd run away and scream, but I said, I can't let this man do this, humiliate somebody like that. So I chased him down the street. His, his accomplice pulled up in the car and he took Clint Eastwood pose, magnum force, shot me. Fortunately, I got out of the way. It just caught me in the upper leg. Do you think you were going to die? Didn't have time to think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. When Didn't, you see the gun like that, you, you, I mean, you just... It's, my mind went in its kind of slow motion. You get all the poor... Poor soldiers going up water, they don't think about how they're going to do in Iraq or places like that. It doesn't enter their consciousness. I don't think so. But it's not a, not a big time incident. He was a criminal who couldn't, couldn't prosecute because he skipped to another state. I know his name and I know his relatives, but I won't do anything about it. That's your way of saying, I know where you live. Yeah. <laughs> I knew where he lived 10 years ago. But it's part of America, you know. There were about that day, I think, the day I got shot. I was in the emergency room, and there were two guys next to me in orange suits, shackled together. They'd been trying to escape from the chain gang. <laughs> they got shot. Asking for Coca-Cola. We're in a hospital. We want Coca-Cola. So, it's the best place to get shot in America because it, they know how to deal with it. But it's a very underfunded city, that's why the music's important. And at the time I was developing a, for the local schools in New, in New Orleans, uh, a marching band to raise funds for Mardi Gras. So I was working on a project down there. It gave me some kudos when I went to the meeting. Hey, there's a guy who got shot. <laughs> We've got loads. I just, I just want to go back to one thing that you said earlier and ask you about um, an earlier song. I mean, you said every time you write a song, you try and make it the best song ever. Do, do you know, you know, when you'd written Waterloo Sunset, did you think, I've written the perfect pop song? I don't know if it's a, thank you for saying the perfect pop song. It's one of them. Um, I was so... It sounds weird on a great state of emotionally and creatively. I didn't think about it. I said, it's done. And I didn't tell the band the lyrics until I sang them in the studio because I thought they might laugh at them. Because it's quite romantic. And I'm not, don't do romantic songs. I didn't do many at that time. It's all aggression. But you, you get, when we made Sunny Afternoon, I knew would be a number one. When we made you really got me, we were just four scruffy guys in a van, but we knew it would be a number one. You, you get a feeling. Um, sometimes when you live through tracks, making a track in a studio like here, it made all the records here come, come dancing from come dancing to our country. You, you get the feeling this is going to be special, we're going to make this special. Then. It's not until you, you hear it on the radio you think, did that wrong. So it's all to do with unpredictable circumstances. Waterloo Sunset, I knew I had a nice song. It's just, I just took extra care to make sure there's nothing on the record, either guitar, vocals, acoustic, bass, 
and I put a piano on at the end. That's all it is. Minimalist. And are you, are you happy to be a, a knight of the realm? I mean, is that is that very rock and roll? Or? Rock and roll. I've never been rock and roll. Uh, I don't have the sunglasses to prove it. But I, I think I did it when I got the notification of it. I, I thought about it. I did it for my parents, really. Because um, if I hadn't accepted it, they would have come down to haunt me. I know that I'm on a quiet life. I've got a busy enough life without being haunted. So Ray Davis, thank you very much. Oh, thanks, man. That was great. Thank you very much. Okay.